I'd like to invite the panel back up here, and I'm glad we left some time for discussion because we have almost over 30 questions that were electronically submitted as well as audience participation. While everybody's getting up here, I just have a quick poll for the audience. There's been a lot of questions about routine pH and manometry. Just show of hands, who in their practice does routine manometry before a hiatal hernia? Okay, so a little over half the room, I think. And who does selective? Okay, um, other questions about terms of wrap, and this is kind of a three-part, well, a one-part question, but um, show of hands whose default is a Nissen for a paraesophageal hernia? Okay, about 50, 60%. Whose default is a toupee? Interesting. And who, d who pexies? Any routine pexiers? Interesting, okay. Well, we'll get the, what we'll do is we'll alternate between the audience and our electronic questions, uh, so please go ahead. Joe Dodd, Nevada, Missouri. I should point out, I, I, it was mentioned a couple times about the anemia and the Cameron's ulcers. Uh, a third of patients with parasophageal hernia have an iron deficiency anemia. And actually, only the minority actually have Cameron's ulcers. Uh, many of these patients have an otherwise unexplained iron deficiency anemia that the uh, operation will correct. And it's amazing, some of these people have been followed by uh, hematologists, oncologists for a long time or present with symptoms of their anemia and not their hiatal hernia. So I just want to make it very clear that you don't have to have Cameron's ulcers to have anemia. I actually think you probably still have the Cameron's ulcers, but you're not seeing them at your endoscopy. It's not always easy to evaluate the entire stomach. But I agree with you, anemia is, uh, I, I actually operate on a hematologist with anemia. <laughs> who uh, had bone marrow biopsies, and, and uh, I cured her anemia, so. <laughs> well, and they're often transient, too. You may just not scope them the day they have them, but they're there chronically. Okay, so one of the questions uh, electronically was, what kind of postoperative restrictions do you pr uh, ask of your patients afterwards? Are there lifting restrictions, specifically weight? Are there bending restrictions? What kind of activity restrictions? Restrictions, post-op restrictions. Just go down yeah. the I, I brought that up, so I guess I can start. Um, again, you know, I don't think there's any evidence for this, so it'll be interesting to see how much variation there is on the panel. But uh, generally, what I tell people is, you know, not more than 15 pounds for four to six weeks if they can tolerate that in terms of lifting. Of course, you know, I think we we know from one of Dr. Hennerford's studies, um, not pertaining to parasophageal specifically, but a lot of involuntary activities involve higher intra-abdominal pressure than lifting heavy weights, but those are things like sneezing, coughing that you can't necessarily restrict for your patient, so we just do what we can. The question is post-operative restrictions after this? I don't give them very many. It all depends on the, uh, the type of fundoplication I did. There's some food restrictions, but I mean, you gotta remember that a good cough, sneeze, or laugh is a pretty violent contraction of your diaphragm. If you, don't, if you think that by telling them they're not go out and pick up a, their 25-year-old grandchild or something like that, that that's going to make a big difference in terms of what happens to the, to the hiatal hernia repair, I think you're fooling yourself. I mean, you know, so I tell them I let their body be their guide and let them do whatever they feel like whenever they feel like they want to do it, by and by and large. S since most of my patients use walkers pre-op, I usually don't. Uh, <laughs> I usually don't restrict it much, but what I do tell, and there are you know, a number of young ones too, I don't think it's a, a, a weight limit. What I tell them is not to do stuff early on where they have to hold their breath while they're doing it. So if it's something where they, they have to stop, so I tell them that the test is pre-op, doing stuff they have to do at work or whatever, try speaking as they start the activity. If they have to stop speaking, that's too much for that first six weeks or whatever. For me, the biggest thing I can do to try to prevent an immediate recurrence is preventing postoperative nausea and vomiting. I tell them I would rather them go out and load a truck than to be retching and vomiting after the operation. That is very violent against the area you've just worked on. So every case, I turn to the anesthetist or anesthesiologist and say, have you attacked two of the three nausea centers with at least the drugs. We put them while they're in the hospital on schedule Zofran, and we have breakthrough medications with strict orders. If the patient complains of nausea or if they begin to vomit, immediate call. It's not something where they sit for six hours retching before you hear about it. Thank you. Uh, Simon Bergman from McGill University. Uh, there was some data presented on uh, gastropexy and use of pegs, and it, it seemed that the 
the recommendation was to do this in certain high-risk patients who would be too high risk for a, I suppose, a repair, a formal repair. Uh, so how do you select these patients? Who's too high risk for a repair uh, as opposed to being too high risk for a general anesthesia and pneumoperitoneum? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, partly is, is patients uh, with uh, pulmonary compromise, uh, patients that aren't going to be a great, uh, 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 a good risk for uh, extended pneumoperitoneum. Uh, debilitated patients, uh, patients, uh, you know, a lot of these patients were also um, uh, patients with dementia and things like that, and it was almost a, as a kind of a palliative maneuver. Um, but that is also, you know, potentially a bailout maneuver that you could use. I'd like to make one little comment about that. Um, since I was sort of brought up in laparoscopy using diagnostic laparoscopy under local anesthesia, uh, you can see absolutely everything at pressures around eight or so. Um, so you'd be surprised at how well the sickest of patients will tolerate a pneumoperitoneum of eight or nine, and you'll be doubly surprised of how well you can image the hiatus at that pressure. So, and I have honestly not yet seen a patient who can't tolerate that type of pneumo pressure, which is why I think the instance of having someone who can't tolerate an operation who's got really needs one for a paraesophageal is really close to zero. But I'd like to comment, Pe PEXI, PEXI doesn't prevent recurrent hiatal hernia. At best, PEXI might minimize or prevent torsion. The other thing that I will say is a PEG also doesn't prevent recurrent hiatal hernia. Uh, I do use a PEG. I use a PEG when I have to do a lot of kind of manipulation of the stomach to get the stomach back into the abdomen. And I think there's going to be a fairly high risk if the patient's going to have a period of gastroparesis after surgery. I use a peg not to anchor, but for decompression. So these patients, I send these patients home with instructions then if they have bloating or nausea, they open and vent their peg tube for 20 to 30 minutes. And some of these patients may need to do that for a day or two but I'd much rather have them with a peg and venting than sitting there with a gas bloat and distension early post-op while we're waiting for gastric function to return. But I think, I think it's a, a misperception that we can use these tubes to prevent recurrence. And you all have gone back in on a patient who's had a prior peg and there's just a strand uh, between the stomach and the ventral abdominal wall, not enough to prevent a recurrent hernia. And, and actually, when, when we do, do, do these uh, uh, gastropexies, actually, the, the, we're not repairing the hernia at all. The cruise is left, left open. So, <laughs> yeah, um, you're, just, you're just anchoring it so it doesn't torse again right. uh, and get back up there in a, in a torsed fashion. So there have been some questions on relaxing incisions. So a question for the uh, panel is, have you ever seen uh, recurrences actually through where the relaxing, relaxing incision is made? Uh, can you do both right and left side? What happens if you try to relax even both sides and can't get the hiatus closed? So I, I already uh, said that I've never done a left-sided relaxing incision, so I can't uh, answer that. Maybe some other people in the panel have. So I've always done right side, and I think with a caudate lobe and stuff there, I think it's very uh, unlikely for there to be a recurrence through there, but I guess it possibly could happen. Um, the, there was a, a paper on relaxing incisions uh, from University of Washington at a previous session, and they had seen two recurrences at the relaxing incision site made on the left side and closed with a uh, bioprosthetic material. So again, if you do it on the left side, uh, put prosthetic material in. Um, but otherwise, I've not seen any problems with that. The, the only clinical problem we've seen with some of these relaxing incisions has been flu fluid cl collections in the, in the, in the pleura or in the mediastinum. And I'll comment. I have, I have had some where I've had to do both. I've never seen a recurrence on the right. I have seen a recurrence on the left. You need to use a prosthetic on the left side, a, a, a synthetic. You can't use a bio. Um, and I've never had a patient where relaxing incisions on both sides did not allow the career to come together posteriorly. If, if you're not making a big enough relaxing incision if you can't get right. the career together posteriorly. Another audience question. Yeah, hi, uh, Lorenzo Ferry, McGill University. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, the program committee for putting together such a phenomenal uh, session. This really is 
Uh, it really is a, a very informative uh, session. So, uh, my question really uh, refers to uh, Ted's last um, uh, uh, presentation on revisional surgery. Uh, and particularly the, the big plan B option, which, was, which I, I saw that was missing, which is esophagectomy. I vividly remember Andre Duroncel telling me, you know, if you, after two, two revisions, that esophagus has to come out, or each junction has to come out. I mean, we may not all uh, agree with that threshold, but I'm wondering uh, from the panels um, uh, to hear their opinions about whether, uh, at what threshold would they consider resecting a non-functional esophagus uh, after uh, revisional surgery? I, I, Lorenzo, I just figured you were busy enough. So, um, no, I, I mean, I think that's true, and I, I left it off the list, but um, I always try to salvage the stomach and the GE junction, but there are situations where the esophagus is, you know, just when your Penrose snaps like that, there's no other option here. There, that patient's going to have at least a partial esophagectomy in Ivor Lewis or something. So uh, patients with horrible motility, multiple redos, I think the <coughs> end-stage esophagi that uh, that's not functional anymore. I think those are, are rare. If And most of the time, you know, the first revision is always approachable laparoscopically, almost always. The second revision, the results start to get much worse. Certainly a third revision is where we start thinking of other things. And esophagectomy, I think, is rarely performed on those extreme cases. So, so for me, a, a esophagectomy really has to do more with esophageal failure, yeah. and that's an end-stage achalasia, which may be a secondary achalasia from stricture and other problems or a long-term torsion. But it's rare on a redo or a third-time redo. What has changed is that 10 years ago, I would do third-time redos without thinking about it. Now, the vast majority of third-time patients are receiving a RU and Y as opposed to going back and just banging my head against the wall again and again. So those third time patients now usually do get a ruin why. Just want to ask, do another audience and panel poll, how many people never put mesh at the hiatus in a standard? Okay. For yeah. those of you, you almost, never, almost, almost never, almost. You know, unless it's a not special at, circumstance. Not at the hiatus. Okay. On a relaxing incision, not at the hiatus. Now, for those of you who put mesh, how many people use biologic mesh routinely? How about synthetic? Anybody putting synthetic mesh? Okay, a couple, a couple people doing that. Okay. Another question from the uh, audience. Um, with regards to mediastinal fluid and other uh, fluid loculations up in the chest, how often do you see these and how do you deal with them? Whether it's yeah. directly in the mediastinum or after having the relaxing incisions and having oh, them. Really so I'll, I'll start. I rarely see it, but I don't look for it. I suspect it's there a lot. I mean, if you think about it, you've got this raw surface up in the mediastinum, and you've been way up there and pulled this huge sack out. I suspect if you looked, you'd find fluid in there a lot. Um, but I don't look for it. Uh, I'm curious to hear from Matt. He mentioned he's had a couple on these. Um, I can't remember the last time I've actually had to drain or do anything for mediastinal fluid collection. Right, and, <clears throat> and it's very rare. It's very uncommon, we don't look for it. But if a patient is symptomatic, uh, then we will go ahead and get a chest film and see what it looks like. But the vast majority of these are sympathetic effusions and just go, go away over time. Uh, it's the same with after you know making a capnothorax intraop. Don't get a chest x-ray post-op unless they're having <laughs> problems, because you'll get the urgent call to put a chest tube in when the patient doesn't need it. So one of the little minor things from the beginning when I, I early stage, I had a uh, hematoma in the mediastinum. The patient was on heparin post-op. I have since do not, since they go home on day one anyway, I don't use heparin when I do a mediastinal dissection. And I, I, I don't know if that was the reason that I got the hematoma, but I haven't had one since. Um, they're really difficult to deal with, really difficult to deal with. And uh, interventional radiology doesn't want to have anything to do with them. And, and, and depending on how symptomatic they are, they very frequently will need to be drained operatively. So uh, don't, if you're using heparin for prophylaxis, venous prophylaxis, I would suggest you don't do that when you go up in the mediastinum like that. Uh, back mic first. Kirpal Singh, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. I have one observation. I wanted to see if you guys had noticed something similar. I do a lot of parasophageals as well. And then two questions. Um, I notice oftentimes the left vagus is tethered near the left pulmonary structures and really have to go fairly lateral 
to release that. And if, if you don't do that, sometimes it just, there's just tethered right there. Um, so I'm not sure if other people have noticed that or not. Second, how high do you go in the meat? I mean, I always go above the pulmonary vessels. That's just my routine. But do you stop short? Like, do you keep measuring the esophageal length, intra-abdominal, and then stop? Or do you always go to, say, a subcranial area, and then you can't go any further? And at that point in time, you're kind of done with that portion of the dissection. And the second question, say you do go to the level of the, as high as you could go, subcranial level, um, and the G junction is still right at the level of the hiatus. So, so is it terribly bad to do the wrap there? As, you know, oftentimes when you do a repair, even with the mesh 50% recurrence rate, most of those people are still not symptomatic. I mean, they have a recurrence, but the wrap is above in the chest, but they're clinically asymptomatic. So rather than doing a collis, could you compromise and say G junction is in, is in intra-abdominal, let's do the wrap here. So if I, it's hard for us to hear, but if I understand correctly, with the anterior vagus, if you stay outside of it, beyond it, you can almost always mobilize it, get it back alongside the esophagus. Right. How high to go? When I see the anesthesiologist, I stop. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I will go very, very high, circumferentially, avoiding both vagus nerves. But with that, you almost always truly 1% or less of the time will you not have that three or four centimeters of esophageal length. Right. I do think it's a bad thing to wrap right at the hiatus. Either you need to do more mobilization or you need to consider a lengthening procedure because I think if you wrap with G junction at the hiatus, you're going to have a recurrence, very high chance of recurrence. So okay. another little technical tr trick to that, at least what I've learned over the years, is <laughs> instead of uh, we very frequently use a Nathanson retractor. I don't know how many people use that. Probably most. Does everybody use a Nathanson? Or? Okay, so if you don't use a Nathanson to get, you can use a just a palpating probe or some five millimeter instrument and lift up the, the apex of the hiatus and that will get you way, way up in the mediastinum, much farther than a Nathanson will give you exposure. So that's another little trick to get up high. But the real trick is to take that huge hernia sac out. I just want to make a Maybe comment. Maybe Dimitri, Dimitri probably has a comment or two. On I, I just wanted to tell you about the wrapping when you're right at the G junction. And I think if you scope those patients, a lot of times what you're doing is actually wrapping a little bit of the tubularized stomach so your wrap is too low. Okay. Although let me, let me, Ted, I, I, I agree, but is that bad? Because a lot of these patients with chronic hernias have tubularized that proximal part of the stomach, and essentially they have a, a, a collis anatomy in many ways, and, and you think it's bad to wrap right there? If no, I think it's not always bad, but if you make that, that, that those are, that's like a slip Nissen. Yeah. So a lot of times they end up with this post-op dysphagia, and mm -hmm. you end up with some of these patients dilating them and dilating them. Uh, Dimitri. Thank you very it's, much. It's working. Thank you. <laughs> I have one quick comment about the esophagus and how much can you get. Uh, we actually published a study a couple of years ago, and, and what we essentially did is we kept dissecting up and measuring, dissecting up and measuring, and we measured two ways uh, with a, a laparoscopic uh, measuring stick and also endoscopically. And if you go 18 centimeters up, uh, that's uh, almost as... Uh, uh, until you see the uh, anesthesiologist, uh, Steve, uh, it's up to the, it's, it's right past the azagus. You'll get about five centimeters of esophagus. That's, uh, that's in the, uh, that's in the uh, uh, Journal of uh, Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and, I, and, and it's, been, uh, it's been repeated, and I, I think that's probably what you can get, about five centimeters is, is, is what I would say. But I have a question for Steve uh, Eubanks, who brought this up, and I think it's a very important question. There's been a rash, uh, an outbreak, a, a, an epidemic, of bariatric surgeons performing ruin wide gastric bypasses and failed missions. I'd like to get the panel's thoughts on this problem uh, because uh, I'm thinking uh, these guys don't even give it a shot. They just ruin why these patients. And it's not clear to me what failed about the Nissen in the first place when these patients come to me with, with, with ant you know, problems thereafter. Thoughts? So as I said, I, increasingly on third times and certainly fourth time redos when patients show up and they've, they've been to who knows where. And again, one of the things I think when you're doing redo surgery, one of the biggest flaws you can do is to assume that they had a bad surgeon the first time. 
you have to assume they actually had a very good rap, and yet they failed. Now, why did they fail? What was their pressure problem? What was their tish tissue problem? So you don't simply repeat a bad fund application. But I am finding when we get to a third time that many times the tissue integrity is so poor, we're bringing together frayed, thin tissue that's not going to hold well, and many times there's already been mesh there, other things, and I find in that situation if I just go ahead and, and do a ruin Y, and I don't do bariatric surgery electively, so um, I, that's not my default naturally, but I go that route on a third and certainly a fourth time. Ellen, do you have any comments? Well, I guess I'm just wondering from your question, you know, are those patients who qualify for bariatric surgery? Because if they have another indication for weight loss surgery, and a, a lot of the patients that we see pre presenting for reduce, you know, they would, it would be indicated for them to have bariatric surgery just according to the NIH criteria. So I, th I think if they're patients that meet those criteria, then they're going to benefit from the weight loss surgery, and they don't have to wait for their third time redo to get that. Uh, Dimitri, let me, and, and I, don't, uh, I don't mean to offend anybody, but there's good data in the literature. John Hunter and I looked at our 300 patients that we did redos on, and up to three redos by a surgeon that has experience with redos, you still have a good chance of a good outcome in preserving anatomy. At the fourth redo, your chance of uh, resolving that patient's issue is probably gonna drop into the 50 to 60% range. So I'm concerned that an easy default on a second redo now is just to do a RUI. Uh, and that's a completely different outcome than a patient on whom you can do a redo and preserve anatomy. So I'll, I'll up to four. On the fourth one is when I'll consider a RUI if I can't get it because I know I'm in the 50-50 camp. But anything up to four, I still try to get them uh, a redo with preserved anatomy and a fundal application. I don't do any bariatric surgery, and I'm at the three to four range, somewhere between three and four, and a lot of the threes are going to need it too. Would any of you consider a ruin Y initially in a patient whose BMI is over 35 if you had elected to, yeah, to um, repair I, them in the first place? I won't do a primary on a patient whose BMI is over 35. Would you do a primary on a BMI greater than 35? I'm sorry, primary re per Parasophageal. With a Nissen. I, um, yes, I would. Sometimes, uh, but generally I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll do a primary repair up to about 40. Okay. And then after 40, there's a poster actually here this week that talks about BMI and, and hiatal hernia recurrence, and there's no, in, no uh, correlation with BMI. Would you recommend a ruin Y for that patient, or would you still recommend uh, a traditional new center two-pack? So it depends. It depends how young the patient is, what their comorbidities are. I think just because if they're, if they're 85, which a lot of my patients are just like Nats, they, they share the same walkers. Um, uh, then I don't think a ruin Y is necessarily the best thing mm -hmm. for them to kind of learn that whole new lifestyle and so on. So I don't routinely offer it unless they're young. And then I'll offer it if they refuse, I'll still try to do a Nissen on them. Uh, Raj? Dana, um, I was going to ask the same question actually. So morbidly obese patient, parasophageal hernia, um, uh, would you do a, a straightforward, and you've kind of started <laughs> to answer it. Um, is there any role for a sleeve in these patients? A sleeve? Um, I, I've done a few sleeves, mainly because the fundus was so beat up. So it's usually on a revisional uh, patient, not a primary one. My worry about sleeves is you don't have to worry about it re-herniating and twisting necessarily, but a lot of those patients get horrible reflux. And a sleeve is a great way to generate reflux, especially if you have a weak LES. Sorry. Uh, uh, the Italians published uh, a report last year in the annals of uh, high incidence of gastroparesis in patients who have recurrent uh, or breakdown Nissen's or recurrent hiatal hernias. So my practice is to get a solid gastric emptying study on all these patients and potentially do a pyloroplasty at the same time. I was wondering what the thoughts of the, uh, the panel are about that. Pyloroplasty at the same time. Delay gastric emptying, pyloroplasty at the same time. Pyloroplasty Delay gastric emptying, pyloroplasty. Well, uh, my, I'll, I'll offer a comment, you know, uh, gastric emptying studies are very difficult to interpret or rely on, even when anatomy is normal. So I'm very concerned uh, that if you use gastric emptying studies or patient symptoms to decide that they're going to have delayed gastric emptying and do a pyloroplasty, that you're going to wind up with 2 to maybe 4% of patients with uh, intractable uh, diarrhea and dumping. 
So um, my approach in that is to fix, anatomically fix the problem, use a peg tube, and then see after they're fully recovered if they still have delayed gastric emptying that I can document. And then I'll go back and do a pyloroplasty later uh, rather than trying to combine it in the first operation. So we're a bit over time, so we'll take the last two audience uh, questions. Yeah, hi, Stan Smith from uh, Klamath Falls, Oregon. I was curious, uh, how do you counsel your patients, number well, two questions, how do you counsel your patients who are adamant against the fund application for this scenario? And has anyone looked at putting mesh on the thoracic side of the diaphragm uh, instead of the abdominal side? Mesh on the thoracic side. Patients, patients who won't have a Nissen who just say, I won't let you do a Nissen? They're up, you know, afraid of the gas blow, the other symptoms you get typically, or can't vomit. I have a patient coming up and he just doesn't want one. He wants a gastropexy, we talked about it. I'm just concerned about high incidence of recurrence. And, you know, how do you I get would over do that? everything I could to talk them into at least a partial fund application. Sure. I mean, the problem is you've, you've seen some of the dissection and you totally tear apart all of the connections at the GE junction. If they didn't have reflux before, they almost certainly will post-op right. and I will push them hard to do something. Well, so. you know, the other reason that we do a fund application is for some of the buttress effect. Exactly. And so yeah. there's the reflux and the buttress effect you, uh, you, know, do a, you don't do a fund application and you're going to have a higher likelihood of uh, recurrence and reflux. So I, I'm with Nat. I push him. I, I'm not sure I give him the option. Okay. And mesh on the mesh thoracic side. Mesh on. I, the only thing worse than not trying sure to take it out on it. the abdominal side is taking it out on the, <laughs> on the thoracic side. But I, <laughs> it gives me heartache to think short, about short that. Short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a consensus on something. Uh, Pete Hollowell, Charlottesville, Virginia. Just a quick technical question. For your three-time redos when you're doing a Ruin Y, uh, are you taking down the wrap or are you leaving that intact and doing the Ruin Y below it? I always, I always take down the wrap. Always. Yeah. Take, it, take it down. I, I think that's a message that Ted made, which I think is really important. When you're doing a redo, you have to take everything apart and then put it back together again. I've seen a bunch of these where the surgeon kind of cut most of the adhesions, but the wrap looked okay, so he just left it alone, and it, it doesn't work. So you got to make sure you take it all apart and put it back together. Any other comments? Okay, well, again, we've gone a little bit over, but I think we've had an excellent discussion. I'd like to thank all the panelists for being up here today. Thank you very much.